and welcome to Friday Reads, where we help you find your next read. My name is Jill. And I'm Julie. And this week we are exploring books you can find in the 100s in the Dewey Decimal System. We're switching over and focusing on nonfiction this week. So the Dewey Decimal classifications were created by Melville Dewey. This is the most widely used library classification scheme in the world. Dewey worked at the Amherst College Library in the 1870s, and when he worked there, he began to reclassify the facility's books and how they were organized. So that's where this all started. So today we are starting with the 100s. There is a 0 to 100 classification also, where you would find books on how to use computer programs like Excel for Dummies, how to use my iPhone, the Farmer's Almanac. And we decided not to talk about those. We thought those books were kind of self-explanatory. So we're going to jump right into the 100 series. All right, and my first one is The Little Book of Huga. Huga is a Danish word used when acknowledging a feeling or a moment, whether alone or with friends, at home or out, ordinary or extraordinary, as cozy, charming, and special. <coughs> Huga doesn't require learning how to, adapting it as a life site, or buying anything. So this book is all about how to get there. Denmark is often said to be the happiest country in the world. That's down to one thing, Huga. You know Huga when you feel it. It is when you are cuddled up on a sofa with a loved one or sharing comfort food with your closest friends. It is those crisp blue mornings when the light through your window is just right. Who better than Mike Wicking to be your guide? Mike Wicking. Wicking. To be your guide on all things yoga. Mike is a CEO of Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen. And I love that there is a CEO of Happiness Research <laughs> Institute. And has spent years studying the magic of Danish life. In this beautiful, inspiring book, he will help you be more Hugo, from picking the right lighting and planning a dinner party and creating an emergency Hugo kit and even how to dress. So if you want to like have a more relaxing life, I guess. <laughs> this is a good, I read good that try. book. That was cute. The Danish, the Danes are. Yeah. <laughs> and my first pick today is The Haunting of Alma Fielding by Kate Summerscale. This is one of our new books. It was published in 2020, and this is classified in the 130 Paranormal Phenomena section of the 100s. It's London, 1938, in the suburbs of the city, an ordinary young housewife has become the eye in a storm of chaos. In Alma Fielding's modest home, china flies off the shelves, eggs fly through the air, stolen jewelry appears on her fingers, white mice crawl right out of her handbag, beetles appear from under her gloves, in the middle of a car journey, a terrapin materializes on her lap. Nander Fodor, a Jewish-Hungarian refugee and chief ghost hunter for the International Institute for Psychical Research, reads of the case and hastens to the scene of the haunting. But when he starts his scrupulous investigation, he discovers that the case is even stranger than it seems. By unraveling almost peculiar history, he finds a different and darker type of haunting trauma, alienation, loss, and the foreshadowing of a nation's worst fears. As the specter of fascism lengthens over Europe and as Fodor's obsession with the case deepens, Alma becomes even more disturbed. With rigor, daring, and insight, the award-winning pioneer of nonfiction writing, Kate Summerskill, shadows his inquiry delving into long-hidden archives to find the human story behind a very modern haunting. My next one is if you're wondering if self-help is for you. It's called Help Me. One woman's quest to find out if self-help can really change her life. This is by Marianne Power. It's a hilarious and heartwarming rampage through the world of self-care. Marion Power is a self-help junkie. For years, she lined her bookshelves with dog-eared copies of The Definitive Guide after Definitive Guide on how to live your best life. Yet one day she woke up to find out the life she dreamed of and the life she was living were not miles but continents apart. So she set out to make a change, or actually make every change. Marianne decided to Marianne decided to finally find out if her elusive perfect life, the one without debt, anxiety, hangovers, or Netflix marathons, the one where she healthily bounced around town with perfect teeth to meet the cashmere sweater wearing man of her dreams, lay in the pages of those books. So for a year, she vowed to test a book a month, following its advice to the letter, taking the surest road she knew to the perfect Marianne. 
As her year-long plan turned into a demented roller coaster where everything she knew was turned upside down, she found herself confronted with a different question. Self-help can change your life, but is it for the better? This book is great if you want to see if self-help is for you. I don't know, it sounds kind of funny to read too, like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> see what kind of advice she follows. And my second pick is The Practice, Shipping Creative Work by Seth Godin. And this is also in our news section. This one's classified in the 150 psychology classification of the 100s. It's from the best-selling author of Lynchpin, Tribes, and the Dip. Comes this little book that will inspire artists, writers, and entrepreneurs to stretch and commit to putting their best work out into the world. Creative work doesn't always come with a guarantee, but there is a pattern to who succeeds and who doesn't. And engaging in the consistent practice of its pursuit is the best way forward. Learning to trust yourself, your audience, and your work is the core component of the practice. Whether your creative work takes the form of a painting, a song, or a company, there is no formula for success, but there is a pattern all successful creatives engage in. In this book, he shows you what it takes to turn your passion from a private distraction to a productive contribution, the one you've been seeking to share all along. With this book as your guide, you'll learn to dance with your fear, to take the risks worth taking, and to embrace the empathy required to make work that contributes with authenticity and joy. This book had a 4.15 rating on Goodreads, so I thought it sounded kind of like an interesting book to pick up. I feel like I could use that practice. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a very helpful book that a lot of people could use. A Good Apology. Oh, there you go. Four Steps to Make Things Right. This groundbreaking book on apologies explains how they work, why they're so hard, and why they are essential for rebuilding relationships. We've all done something wrong or made a mistake or insulted someone even if by accident. We've all been hurt and wanted the other person to help us heal. It may be surprising, but the breaches themselves aren't the real problem. Our inability to fix them is what causes trouble. In A Good Apology, Dr. Molly Howes uses her experience with patients in her practice, research findings, and news stories to illustrate the power and importance of a thorough apology. She teaches how we can all learn to craft an effective apology with four straightforward steps. An apology is a small-scale event between people, but it's enormously powerful. This comprehensive book gives readers the tools to fix their relationships, make amends, and move forward. With it, you'll fully understand the meaning and importance of this universal and timeless endeavor. A good apology. Oh, yeah. I should make sound my... like a valuable book. Should be required reading, maybe. I'm going to make my <laughs> husband read it, I think. <laughs> and my third pick is Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking by Susan Cain. This was published back in 2012. It's also in the 150 classification, the psychology part of the 100s. This book has been described as the book that started the quiet revolution. At least one third of the people we know are introverts. They are the ones who prefer listening to speaking, who innovate and create but dislike self-promotion, who favor working on their own over working in teams. It is to introverts, Rosa Parks, Chopin, Steve Wozniak, Dr. Seuss, that we owe many of the great contributions to society. In this book, Susan Cain argues that we dramatically undervalue introverts and shows how much we lose in doing so. She charts the rise of the extrovert ideal throughout the 20th century and explores how deeply it has come to permeate our culture. She also introduces us to successful introverts, from a witty high-octane public speaker who recharges in solitude after his talks, to a record-breaking salesman who quietly taps into the power of questions. Passionately argued, superbly researched, and filled with indelible stories of real people, quiet has the power to permanently change how we see introverts in the world, and equally important, how they see themselves. Her TED Talk has been viewed more than 25 million times, making it one of the most popular of all time. If you're not familiar with the TED Talks, they are influential videos from expert speakers on education, business, science, tech, creativity. They have subtitles in, I think, 100 languages. So, quiet, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. I have that on my bedside table for a while. <laughs> I did not know Rosa Parks was an introvert, though. Like, that had to be hard. It's a lot of no attention. Kidding. 
All right, my next one is a little bit different. Spell crafting, strengthen the power of your craft by creating and casting your own unique spells. By Aaron Murphy Hissock. Hissock. Make your own magic. Spell crafting is a step-by-step -step guide to writing your own spells and timing them for the best effect. From different types of spells to the intentions and powers of different ingredients, you will have everything you need to create unique magic that works best for you. Spell crafting goes beyond basic spell books to explore how and why your magic works, what you can do to improve and strengthen it, and how to troubleshoot when things don't go as planned. Now you can take your magic into your own hands and create a completely personalized spell for wherever life may take you. Some of the magic detailed in this book include a common healing charm, cord spells, including embroidery and cross stitch, instructions for making a talisman, the power of herbs, and a spell to evict your neighbor, which I thought that was fun. <laughs> you want to like cast some spells or see how it's done, this is the book for you. Oh my. my fourth pick today is This Book Will Make You Kinder by Henry James Garrett. This is also in our news section. This is in the 170 Ethics Moral Philosophy classification of the 100s. And he tells us the kindness we owe one another goes far beyond everyday gestures like taking out the neighbor's garbage bins or plugging someone's parking meter, although it's important not to downplay those small acts. Kindness can mean much more. In this timely, insightful guide, the author lays out the case for developing a strong, courageous, moral kindness, one that will help you fight cruelty and make the world a more empathetic place. Building on his academic studies in meta-ethics and using his signature sweet animal cartoons, you can see the dog on the cover, um, the author explores the sources and limitations of human empathy and the many ways, big and small, that we can work towards being our best and kindest selves. A world in which everyone was the fully empathetic of, version of themselves would be a very kind world indeed. And that's the world this book will move us toward. So... This book will make you kinder. And it's illustrated. She's got lots of cute cartoons throughout the book in here. Yeah. So check I feel that like one out. Kindness is trending now. It is, too. I think. So this is one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell. This is Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. Malcolm Gladwell redefined how we understand the world around us. Now in Blink, he revolutionizes the way we understand the world within. Blink is a book about how we think without thinking, about choices that seem to be made in an instant, in the blink of an eye, that aren't as simple as they seem. Why are some people br brilliant decision makers while others consistently inept? Why do some people follow their instincts and win while others end up stumbling into error? How do our brains really work in the office, in the classroom, in the kitchen, and in the bedroom? And why are the best decisions often those that are impossible to explain to others? In Blink, we meet the psychologist who has learned to predict whether a marriage will last based on a few minutes of observing the couple, the tennis coach who knows when a player will double fault before the rocket even makes contact with the ball, <clears throat> the antiquities expert who can recognize a fake at a glance. Here, too, are great failures of Blink. <clears throat> the election of Warren Harding, the new Coke, and the shooting of Amadou Dilao by police. Blink reveals that great decision makers aren't those who process the most information or spend the most time deliberating, but those who have perfected the art of thin slicing, filtering the very few factors that matter from an overwhelming number of variables. Malcolm Gladwell has written a lot of like really interesting books on how things work, including The Outliers, David and Goliath, What the Dog Saw, and Talking to Strangers, which I have on hold right now because I want to learn how to talk to strangers. <laughs> I should check that one out. And my last pick is Goodbye Things by Fumio Sasaki, published in 2017. This is in the 170 classification, The Ethics and Moral Philosophy. The best-selling phenomenon from Japan that shows us a minimalist life is a happy life. This author is not in an is not an enlightened minimalist expert or organizing guru like Marie Kondo. He's just a regular guy who was stressed out and constantly comparing himself to others until one day he decided to change his life by saying goodbye to everything he didn't absolutely need. The effects were remarkable. He gained true freedom, new focus, and a real sense of gratitude for everything around him. In Goodbye Things, Sasaki modestly shares his personal minimalist experience, tongue twister, offering specific tips on the minimizing process and revealing how the new movement can not only transform your space, but truly enrich your life. 
People who like this also like The More of Less, Finding the Life You Want Under Everything You Own by Joshua Becker. The Joy of Less, A Minimalist Living Guide, How to Declutter, Organize, and Simplify Your Life by Francine J. And The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing by Marie Kondo, who I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with these days. So good buy things, how to get rid of things you don't need and find some true happiness amongst your minimalist existence. Although interesting that Marie Kondo's book is not in the 100s. Right. That's mm -hmm. very different. Well, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like and share this video so you can get help other people find things to read. Thanks for watching. Come see us in the library. We're here 9 to 6, Monday through Friday, and we're here 9 to 1 on Saturdays. So we hope to see you soon. Bye, Bye. everyone.